So about five years ago, I found myself in this room, and it was at Google headquarters. And I was collaborating with some of the most, uh, the top innovators in the world, some Nobel laureates, and it was such a small crowd. And I was wondering to myself, why am I here? Why am I, why was I chosen to be amongst these people, these amazing, amazing individuals? And I thought to myself even deeper, I said, I was that kid in elementary school that got kicked out and transferred to another elementary school. So I grew up on a farm in South Central Pennsylvania. And the closest town was about 170 people. And it was a whole, there wasn't a whole lot that I knew about the world. I knew a lot about country life, which was, which was great. But my mind and my brain, I, I constantly wanted to know more. And um, while I was in school, I was very disconnected. I, I, school was very mundane and boring to me. It, it just didn't really make sense. I said, why do I need to learn all these things in school? And I thought to myself, I was like, OK, um, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do in the world. And it was right after I graduated high school that there was all this opportunity out there that I had no idea existed. There were so many, I didn't even know when I was in high school that I could go into the military and be an officer in the military. No one told me this. I was in this little pocket in, in Pennsylvania and there's just, I, I just didn't get any of this information. So I'm like, I feel like I was robbed, you know, as a kid, so. So later in life, you know, things went well and I realized that um, there's a lot of kids like me, you know, as I grew up and, you know, through, through my life, there's a lot of kids like me in school. And they're very disengaged. They're very bored. Uh, things are different nowadays. Like when I, you know, I was bored in school, but, you know, we, we didn't have all this opportunity for technology and we didn't have all these things at our fingertips. So can imagine a kid that can get all their information on this pencil that they use, right? And um, their minds are, they're, they're bored. And uh, for the most part, they're really, really bored. So I thought about this. You know, it really does take a village to raise a child. And what I mean by that is there's, I think nowadays, there's so many ways that we can tie content into a child's learning. Now imagine, we have so many research questions and there's so much data available. Imagine if we were able to incorporate that into the classroom. Imagine if kids had an opportunity to contribute to society by answering real research questions and real data questions. So take for instance, Olivia. And Olivia and her classmates, they're actually working with real neuroscience methods and actually mapping neurons. They're doing real science in the classroom. Along with doing real science in the classroom, the teachers are marrying this with the curriculum and the way they should learn and engage. And they're contributing, potentially, to science. Now imagine that. Imagine if you're in high school and you're able to help a researcher figure out how a brain works. I mean, it's one of the top questions that we have nowadays, right? How do the, it's one of the most complex questions. Imagine if we had tens of thousands of kids in school, in high school, helping research understand how the brain works. I think it's pretty awesome. I think it's pretty powerful. But the other piece of this is, is what does it do for Olivia and her classmates? It gives, imagine the tagline that they can put on their resume in high school. Before they even go into college, they can say, I've done the same thing as a postdoc has done. And look how valuable that would be to a research institute. So if we have so many things available to us, why are we sticking with traditional ways of teaching? I don't understand it. I don't really get it. I think this is very easy for us to incorporate. Here's another situation. So this gal, Cajal. So she's a very smart kid. But I sat down with her, and she told me, she goes, you know, I never really experienced anything. I go to school. 
And I, I, and I go th you know, do what I'm supposed to do in my studies and my books. But it really doesn't make sense to me. And it wasn't until she actually married up with a, lack of better terms, she met up with a biologist. And uh, the biologist took her out in the field along with other students and showed her all these different areas in biology. And something dawned on her. She is, oh my gosh. You know, biology is really interesting to me, but my passion is in fashion design. And she thought, oh, wow, there's so many interesting colors. There's so many interesting things about biology. What if I incorporate this into my fashion design? So she did. So Cajo is a part of the Permian High School in Odessa, Texas. So many of you may have known about Friday Night Lights. And um, it's also part of a district that has 58% at-risk students. What does at-risk mean? That means they're at res risk from graduating from high school. So think about that. Again, these kids, they have what it takes. We are all born with the same amount of brain mass. And it's just a matter of what, how can we really engage kids to get them excited and get them interested in the learning process? And just like Cajal here, it only took a couple minutes from a researcher's time to sit down with her and show her a new light that actually is changing her life. Because as I speak right now, she's competing in states for her design and fashion. These students here are doing something that's it's called citizen science. And citizen science is a fantastic tool. It's a fantastic tool for teachers to bring in real research data questions into the classroom where kids have the opportunity to contribute to society. They can get inspired. They can have tangible learning experiences. They have ownership in their education. And in Shark Finder, these fifth grade kids have an opportunity to be published in a scientific publication by undergraduates at the University of Maryland. How cool would that be? And many of these kids that are working with Shark Finder are going to be acknowledged in publications. Raise your hand if you ever found a first occurrence of a species. I don't, see, I don't see too many hands coming up in there. There's going to be a lot of fifth grade kids that are going to get a first occurrence of a species and published in, in publication from undergraduates at University of Maryland. I think that's just awesome. That's pretty powerful. And I think that's, that's a way that we can really get kids jazzed up in education, is if they are a part of something, they're a part of the community. It's never too young to make an amazing discovery. Now, a lot of you might think this is kind of disgusting. Uh, these kiddos here absolutely loved it. These are first grade kids, and they're holding a very large cockroach. And they're tasked with raising cockroaches in school. So imagine raising cock. You know, there's probably a lot of schools that are trying to get rid of the cockroaches. <laughs> but these kids are actually raising cockroaches. But why? They're doing it for neuroscience. What they're doing is they're raising these cockroaches, and the cockroaches will become the specimens for secondary students to do electrophysiology experiments. Imagine your middle school kid coming home and saying, I'm, I'm doing electrophysiology. Would that just blow your mind as a parent? My kid is doing electrophysiology in middle school. This is happening. These young first grade kids learn the nomenclature about neuroscience. They learn about life cycles. They learn about surgery. They learn about housing or husbandry of animals and animal behavior, life cycles of an animal. They're creating the cockroach hospital because when the cockroaches come back from doing their backyard brains, do it yourself neurophysiology or uh, electrophysiology. They're going back into the cockroach hospital where their gray leg will actually grow back in 80 days. So in turn, after 80 days, they can go back out to surgery. I think that's really cool. There's a lot of components there. I mean, as, par as parents and adults, we might think that's a little, little crazy. But you know what? Uh, it's, it's amazing. Look at their faces. All these kids are like this. In elementary school and first grade, they're all excited. They're intrigued. We take that away from kids. When we put them in the classroom, we take away that, that, that sense of discovery or that want to actually touch and feel something that maybe an adult might, might, might think is uh, disgusting. Let them go. Let them explore. 
So I mean, these were just a few examples of engagement in kids uh, with, uh, with real research data, experiences, giving kids ownership in their education. And there's just tens of thousands of things out there that we can tackle. There's a lot of research questions around climate change. There's tons to learn about paleontology. The brain, like I mentioned, there's so much to, to know and to learn. Why can't we embed that, embed that into our school system? Why can't we make that a part of learning? Why can't we give those kids that opportunity to make amazing discoveries at a young age? Because after all, kids really do pick education. We just got to give them the content. We got to give them those opportunities. Pick education. I pick education. And I pick education. Thank you.